We're talking about heroes. Everybody loves heroes. There's been a tremendous industry of hero, hero comic books, hero worship. I mean, you know, Superman and Batman and all these guys. Now they got a bunch of heroes that are kind of bad people, but I'm talking about good heroes, okay? And uh, everybody, as growing up, everybody wants to be a hero. Maybe when you actually are an adult, you figure, I can't do that, or I, I know I can't fly, I don't have a costume, I'm not a hero. But <clears throat> um, the definition of a hero is someone who is admired, okay, we admire them. He is, they are idolized for courage. They have outstanding achievements, noble qualities, uh, superior qualities, brave, selfless, bravery in the face of danger, we can all see that, willingness to put the needs of others before their own. And that is the definition of a hero out of Merriam-Webster's dictionaries. Now, most heroes don't try to be heroes. You just kind of fall into it. You are at the right place at the right time. You do the right thing. I want you to remember that phrase, do the right thing. And that's what they do. That's why they're heroes. They rush into the building, the 9-11, all the guys who died, even the ones who didn't die, they are heroes because they save people. They put the needs of others ahead of themselves, right? They did the right thing. They did not run away when the building is being bombed. They did not run away. We just lost two policemen and a paramedic down in Burnsville. They were heroes. They talked with that guy for three and a half hours and suddenly he just shot him. They are heroes because they put the needs of others, the, the family that was in danger, and even the guy in, in, instead of themselves. Um, doing what is right in spite of the circumstances, that's what makes a hero. Um, we know all kinds of examples, uh, people rescuing people, the Good Samaritan, heroes. They are heroes because they do the right thing. So if we want to be heroes, which I think that's a good thing to strive for. Like I say, I don't have a costume or anything like that. I don't have a big name, but I still want to be a hero. I want to do the right thing. So, ooh, I got a bug. Goodbye. There. All right. All right, so it was just a little ladybug, but it wasn't a ladybug. It was one of those fake ladybugs, the little black ones, whatever. Anyway, it's down here somewhere. So uh, wonderful God that we have, he gave us the ability to be heroes. And so my first scripture is Romans 2.14. So when Gentiles who do not by nature have the law, in other words, they, they don't know God, they do what the law demands or what God demands. They are a law to themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts. Their conscious, consciences confirm this. And their competing thoughts either accuse or even excuse them. Now he's got the New King James. I have a Christian standard. Uh, New King James, who show the work of the law in, written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. The, this part of Romans talks about um, how there is no excuse for man. Even if you have not heard the gospel, you are answerable to God because he put this conscience in your heart. He put something in there. And you know whether you did right or wrong. And when I was in sin, I could justify my sin by all kinds of different ways, but I knew in my heart it was wrong. When, when I was confronted with the fact that God's gonna show me a moving picture of all that I did in my life and I would be judged on that, I thought, well, I know for sure I'm going to hell because I had a conscience. Even though I didn't know God, I had that conscience in there. So you know right from wrong. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.5. Let me find it here. Uh, 
says, now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from sincere faith. This newer version here, now the goal of our instruction is love that comes from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. If you go down to verse 19, it says, having faith and a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. What I want you to notice here is he puts good conscience and faith together. Um, so that, I'm going down a rabbit hole here. Okay, so what is, what is conscience? Your conscience is, the, this is just from a secular dictionary, the sense of moral goodness of one's own conduct intentions or character, together with a feeling of obligation to, to do right or be good. This is what tells you what's right and wrong. This is your conscience. Okay, so we're doing the right thing. When you don't do the right thing and you go against your conscience, you are hardening your heart. We have that scripture, don't harden your heart. And he's talking to believers, but you can harden your heart as an unbeliever. We see that all the time. People who just uh, are ruthless and evil and they have hardened their heart somewhere along the way that they can kill people, murder people, rob from people. That's hardening their heart. Okay, so he puts conscience, conscious, I can't say it, consciousness, consci anyway, he puts that together with faith. Okay, so what is faith then? So we know the faith chapter is Hebrews 11. So we have this law written in our heart, and, and uh, Paul puts it together with faith. Hebrews 11, faith is the reality. Okay, let's go to the King James here. Oh, no, that's not New King James. What, what version is that? Okay, okay. Now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. That's my version here. So I, I've always had a problem understanding what that meant. The reality of what is hoped for. I, I just doesn't make sense to me. So I made up my own. Well, I mean, it's not scripture, but it makes sense to me, okay? If the Bible doesn't make sense to you, make it make sense to you. Figure it out. I mean, find out what, what they're trying to tell you. Faith is living in and practicing every day God's reality, God's truth. Okay? So get that reality out of there and say God's truth. It's practicing and living in God's truth. What God has told us now and what he has told us about in our future. Even though we don't see it, we don't have it yet, we still believe God. In other words, it's just believing what God says and living that way. That is faith. So the definition here in Hebrews always confused me, but once I figured it out and plotted it out on my own, what does this mean? Then it makes sense. It's just living by believing in God. Just everything he says, the way he is, God's ways are not our ways, right? So that then it makes sense then, okay, I have to live the way God sees it, okay? Verse three says, by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. That also confused me, but then, Someone pointed out about atoms and molecules. And oh, now it makes sense. He made the world out of atoms and molecules. He made what was seen from things that are not seen. Ah, that's cool. That would make me want to be a scientist right there. Just, I mean, you know, everything is made out of atoms and molecules. This is, God made this out of what was not seen. We, we don't see them, but we know they're there. Now with microscopes and all that, we know even more of what's not seen, and that, that God has made the world out of that. So, uh, so can you agree that, that that's, we can have faith, just believing God, okay? 
So I'm going to just go back a little ways here. I'm going to digress it's because he's talking about when the world was created. Okay, so he created Adam and Eve. Created Adam first, then Eve, and then he said, don't eat of this tree. And they both heard it. They both knew what it was. And the, the Bible says the devil came and deceived Eve and told her, oh, isn't this good and beautiful and it'll be really wonderful to eat this thing. It's good for you. It's good for you, honey. You know, and, and uh, he deceived her. He deceived her into thinking that she had a better idea than God. Right? And I want you to remember that. She thought she had a better idea than God. God said, don't eat it. But Eve said, oh, but it looks good. It's good for us. And she brought what the devil said into her own, made it her own. And they ate. Adam ate. Adam, the Bible says Adam was not deceived. He knew. He knew this is not a good thing. I shouldn't do this. Eve does not have a better idea. But, you know, eh, God is grace. God is good. Yeah, I'm just going to. Do this one thing, just this one thing, okay? Because they did what they thought was a better idea. Sin entered the world. It's entered the human race, and it entered the whole world, not just humans, but the whole world. The animals fell, the, the weeds grew. Instead of this beautiful garden, they had pests and all kinds of junk that they wouldn't have had to deal with because they had a better idea. So likewise, I'm just going to pull this in. When you think you have a better idea than God and you act on it, sin enters your world. And it doesn't just enter your world, it enters all of those around you, all that you have about you. Um, if, if you drink too much, your alcoholism destroys families, we know that. Uh, violence, drugs, it, it trickles down, just like it did with Adam and Eve. We have the trickle-down effect. It's not a Reagan thing, it's a sin thing, right? It's, it, it's a trickle-down effect. Uh, immorality, God has rules, you know, you don't sleep around. He has rules, and there, there are consequences. He has consequences. There are diseases, there are unwanted pregnancies, there are a zillion fatherless children around because our culture says that that's fine, but God doesn't say that's fine. He wants a family. God has rules, God, and it's for our own good, but we destroy them because we have a better idea. Well, I'm in love. Yeah, God is love, but he has the right idea. God has the best plan. And he's able to work everything to good. I mean, we, we know this. He is a wonderful God. He really is a wonderful God, or he would have just wiped Adam and Eve off right there. Just, you got a better idea? Oh, yeah, bam, you're done. I mean, God is gracious and wonderful. We know that. So... God's ideas are countercultural. okay? The list goes on. Um, you just don't want to have a better idea than God, okay? Just, just don't, okay. Um, James 4, I have a scripture written here. I don't even remember what it is, but let's take a look at it because I didn't write it for no reason. 4.17. Huh. So to sin... So it is sin to know the good and yet to not do it. So that's a good scripture. That's really concise, really tight and to the point. If you know it's sin and you do it, or it's sin to know what's good and not do it. You know the good to do, you don't do it, it's sin. Okay. So I'm going to go back to Hebrews here, back to our heroes. The book of Hebrews is God's hero, all God's heroes, the heroes of the faith, okay? Verse 6, now without faith it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. 
That's another one that can be kind of confusing. Why would you even pray if you don't believe he is? That's what I first think is. The one who draws near to him must believe that he exists. Why would you even want to draw near to anybody if they're not there? You don't pray unless you believe that there is a God. And why are you praying? You're asking for something. Well, why would you ask someone for something if you don't believe he is? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. So then when he gives you an answer, okay, we've got that far where you believe he exists and he rewards those who seek him. If he tells you what you're seeking him about, but you don't do it, why do you ask him? Doesn't make sense, does it? You will be rewarded if you seek him. And I think the seek him is an is a, overlapping thing. You're not just seeking him for things. You're seeking him for prayers, Lord, guide my day, help me today. And if he starts doing that and you don't listen to him, why are you praying it? Right? If we're asking for the guidance of God, then let's, then let's do it. And we believe he exists. Yes, otherwise you wouldn't be in church here. You must believe that God exists or why sing songs about him? Why, what, are you just fooling yourself? No, you, we have faith, all right? So this whole faith chapter is all about our heroes of the faith. Abraham, when he was called, he left. You can just go down. I'm, I'm going to just, um, sorry, I got a hair in my mouth. You just go down the list. But what if, what if they didn't do what, what they did? They are heroes of the faith because they did what God said. What if they didn't do what God said? What if Abraham didn't? leave his country. I mean, the whole story just falls apart. It, everything falls apart. If he doesn't do what was right, what God told him to, it doesn't work. He went to sacrifice Isaac, and the Hebrews here says, because he believed that God could raise him from the dead, because God had said, your, your seed will inherit the earth, out of you will flow all of these nations. And then God says, sacrifice your son. And he's saying, well, I guess God has another plan. But Abraham believed God. He believed what God said, and that's why he did it. He, uh, Moses left Egypt, and then he came back. He had the burning bush. I mean, he obviously believed that God was once he saw the burning bush. I mean, that's, I would. <laughs> and he instituted the Passover. Passover does not make sense. Killing a lamb and sprinkling the blood on your doorpost, that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. But he did it, and he saved the nation because he did it. He did what God said, even when it doesn't make sense. He parted the Red Sea. Would you walk into a river with... A million people behind you and say come on let's go and what if it didn't open up but it did because he believed God because God said go and he said okay and the minute his foot hit the sea parted but what if he didn't everyone would have died but because he did we can we can believe God for all these miracles because it has happened already what about Rahab and the walls of Jericho? Who marches around a city seven times and blows some horns? Oh, big deal, you know? It's not going to do anything. It's not. It's not. But they did it, and the walls came down. And Rahab, someone asked me, what were those spies doing in the harlot's house? Yeah, that's, a, that's a decent question. Well, if anybody knows anything about prostitution you hang out and you're where the where people come by and you say hi Adal you know why don't you come into my house and she was welcoming now I believe that these were godly men the Bible says they were godly men and they did not have sex with her but she and welcomed them in and they told her God's gonna destroy your city and she believed them and so she uh, protected them, she hid them, and God saved her, 
her and her whole family. Um, what, about, what about the lions? It says, shut the mouths of lions. Do you think when they dropped Daniel in the, in the lion's den or they shoved him in, what, however, I would imagine you do it from up above, you dropped him in, do you think he landed and went, ha? No. He kind of rolled in there and went, oh, lions. Well, it, it says, yeah, yeah, did he shut their mouths? No, God shut their mouths. The lions came up and, brrr, you know, oh, you want a pet, you know? They just, they did not eat him. They did not, uh, maybe God made them so they didn't see him. I don't know. I don't know, but I know God did it. I know, now what if he would have fought to go in? No, no, I'm not going, I'm not going. Well, they would have stabbed him and he would have been dead. You know, you... What if he didn't do what God said? What about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? So Nebuchadnezzar was in a rage because they would not bow down to this statue. And a matter of fact, I got a kick out of this. They said, we don't need to, he said, why won't you bow down to, to my statue? And he, they said, we don't need to answer you. They just smarted off. We don't need to answer that. And they said, if the God we serve exists, he can rescue us. But even if he doesn't, we will not serve or worship your statue, your God. It was his statue. So God can rescue us. I don't know if he will, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down to your statue. Yeah. So they heated the fire seven times hotter than normal because Nebuchadnezzar was so bad. And he sent his soldiers to get them and to throw him in the fire. And as they threw them in the fire, and it says they were bound also, so they rolled into this fire. But the guys that threw him in died. That's how hot the fire was. So as they threw him in, the flames came and killed the guys. That was one hot fire. Talk about tandoori, you know. <laughs> Anyway, they, and then Nebuchadnezzar sees them. He says, I thought you threw them in. Well, they did throw them in, but now I see they're not bound and they're walking around and there's one like the Son of God with them. Now, what if they didn't do, what if they didn't do what, they, what was right? What if they didn't do what was right? What if they just said, well, you know, this one time we'll bow down. We don't mean it in our heart, but we'll bow down. Huh? What, what if they just kind of justified it and said, yeah, yeah, well, we don't mean it, God, we don't mean it, but we're, you know, salam, salam, you know, to the, to the false god. No, they did what was right. They did what was right because they believe God. Even if he doesn't deliver us, we're still not going to worship you. And, uh, and they were delivered. What about the ones who aren't delivered? If you go on into... Hebrews, it talks about the ones that were not delivered, the ones that were sawn in half. The, uh, well, that's not fair. But they all died in faith, believing God. They did not receive the promise that God would deliver them. But they did go to the promised land. They did, they did go to heaven because they did what was right. And the Bible says that the world was not worthy the world being us, we're not worthy to even talk to them because they gave their lives to do what was right. These are our heroes of the faith because they did the right thing. Well, okay, that's all fine and good. That's Old Testament. That's all, you know. <laughs> what about us? What about us? Do you want to be a hero? What does God say in the word? In the Bible is your first thing that you look at. What does God want me to do? Well, there's all kinds of, I mean, you read all the parables of Jesus. You re read, love your enemies, pray for those who despitefully use you, be free from the world, 1 John, I've got that one up here. Sometimes we don't understand what God demands from us, but he, he demands for us to obey his culture, not our culture, to obey his laws, not our 
good ideas. Back to that, we have a better idea. 1 John 2.15 Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride in one's possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world and its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. So that's a promise of God. It's a command of God with a promise. Um, so you don't do what makes earthly sense. A lot of things make earthly sense. Oh, what is a piece of paper? It doesn't mean anything. You know, what is it? we're not married. It doesn't mean anything. Yes, it does. It does to God. It's a covenant. It's a covenant. You enter into a covenant when you're married. And I don't necessarily believe you have to go through the state, but you have a covenant with God, and it's a marriage, and that's what makes it legal in God's eyes. It's not what our culture says, uh, sexual preferences, like I was talking about this morning here. Um, well, I want to be, be a boy. God made you a girl. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry. Rejoice, God made you a girl. Rejoice, God made you a man. That is, the, that is God's order. It's chromosomes. You cannot change that. You do not have a better idea. Oh, I like girls. You do not have a better idea. Or a boy saying, I like boys. You do not have a better idea. That is from the world, the lust of the flesh. That's from the world. You need to do what's right. And in your heart, you know, your conscience, whether you're a Christian or not, knows what's right and wrong. We already established that. What about in your heart, you're praying in the morning, you're saying, God, what do you want me to do today? And you're at the grocery store and God says, go up and tell that person that Jesus loves him. Huh? So why do you pray what? what do you want me to do, God, if you don't do it, right? You have to be open to everything that God tells you in your heart because he talks, as believers, he talks to our hearts. As an unbeliever, I don't remember hearing from God besides being condemned by my own conscience. But as a believer, if you're talking to God, he will tell you what he wants you to do. Quit cheating on your taxes. That's pretty easy. Quit doing that. Treat your family right. You know, you know when you're being mean. You know when you're being wrong. You know that. Dress modestly. Talk purely. It really, really offends me when I hear someone say, God damn it. My heart sinks saying, no, you don't mean that. No, 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 God, please don't, please don't. Don't damn things. And I know it's tempting, you know, something breaks, the wash machine's walking across the floor, you know, and you feel like cussing it out. Don't. No, I want my wash machine. You know why is your wash machine doing that? It's probably because you damned it 27 times before this. You know, if you're cursing your stuff and it's breaking, well, God's believing you. God's listening to what you say. So do, do the right thing, whether it's in the Bible, what the Bible says, or whether it's in your heart, what God says. God says, give this person a card, a encouragement. Go up and encourage them. There's a lot of scriptures in the New Testament that talk about encouraging one another in the faith and building up one another in the faith. It's a lot of, a lot of wonderful things we can do without even trying. If you go down to verse 29, if you know that he is righteous, you know this as well. Everyone who does what is right has been born of him. I never understood, well, I mean, kind of did, righteous, to be righteous, be righteous. It just means do what's right. It's easy. It just means if you do what's right, you're righteous. How easy is that? I'm righteous. I just did something right, I'm righteous, woo. -hoo -hoo -hoo. It's not hard, it's not hard. 
So I want to encourage you to be a hero, a hero of the faith. Do what God says, whether in the word or in your heart. Believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those who seek him. He will reward you. I, uh, blessings, he will just make your way straight. He'll give you blessings. I mean, I just, when you do wrong and something bad happens, you automatically think, uh oh, God saw me and he's judging me. Is that right? If you do wrong and something bad happens, you know that it's God judging you. You know. <laughs> and so do what's right. Then if something bad happens, you can blame it on the devil, for one thing. You can just say, you know, I got a flat tire because my tire's been bald for six months, and so, oh, well, this just happened. You don't have to say, this is God. Me and Kim have a game with stoplights. If you're in a hurry, you're going to get every stoplight red. Oh, God's against me because the stoplight's red. No, the stoplight's red because, and we obey it because we don't want to be like India where you just blow through the lights and who cares, right? That's why, tra if you ever want to look up something funny, look up Indian traffic on, on YouTube and uh, then you'll know why we have stoplights, why we have rules, why we have dotted lines down the middle of the road. When Emmanuel was here first, he said, oh, wow, this works really good. Everybody stays in their lane, and it actually works. And people stop for stoplights, because in India, uh-uh. No, doesn't mean anything. It's just a pretty decoration on the road. If you need to go around it, it because you're so important, um, you don't have to obey that. That's how it is. But God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Be a hero to your family, to your neighbors, to your coworkers. Let, they should know that whatever you do, you're doing what's right. They, they should never be a, a thought in their heart that, well, she just did that because this and this and this, and an evil, an evil thought, that this person is evil and so they're just trying to go around and do something evil. That should never be what someone thinks of you. You should not have someone think of you as an evil soap opera character that's just trying to destroy marriages or whatever. Get away with stealing money, doing, doing evil. You never should never be named among a believer. But you want your family to love you. You want your family to honor you. You want to do what's good for your family, what's good for your neighbors, what's good for everyone here. Let them know, so be a hero. So my whole sermon is, you can be a hero too. You just have to do what's right. Just do what's right. And then you're right, you're not only a hero, but you're a righteous hero. Amen. Yeah, amen. So that's the end of my sermon. Have it trickle down and be hero. Be a hero to those who know you. Amen. Amen. That's it. Do you want to close? I, I do want you to remember, do what's right, and remember you don't have a better idea. Those two things. You do, that just hit me. I don't have a better idea. That's what sin is. Go ahead. <laughs>